Hello. So in this video, I'm going to talk to you about Gwendolyn McEwen's play, The Birds, uh, which is a Canadian adaptation of Aristophanes' Birds. McEwen was an amazing poet, novelist, and playwright who was really fascinated by the ancient world, um, especially ancient Egypt and the Near East, but she was also interested in ancient Greece. And so uh, she, trans she, she adapted the birds, she also adapted uh, the Trojan women. But like Yvette Nolan's adaptation of the birds, McEwen gives us quite a different ending than Aristophanes does. Um, so that's what I'm going to primarily be focusing on in this video. Uh, now the beginning portion, the first say, three quarters of McEwen's play is, is actually fairly similar to Aristophanes. It follows along the same lines. Um, and there's a couple of things uh, that I think are I do that I do think are really interesting and, and things that I, I think are noteworthy. Uh, so one of the things is uh, so the the two characters uh, who in Aristophanes have full names are just X and Y. So these are the two young men from Metropolis uh, who who come and try and convince the birds to. Uh, create the city of Cloudsville. Um, so we have a reference here to Y, who's one of the two uh, characters, and this is early in the play, assuming the commanding stance of a Columbus and pointing toward the sheer drop sign, which is at the which is upstage at the the back of the the set. So this reference is really interesting, especially if we look at this play in comparison with something like Yvette Nolan's adaptation of, of The Birds, because it gives us that hint of sort of thinking about Canadian post-colonialism, but it's not as developed here. It's it's largely a it's basically a passing reference in this play, whereas that idea of uh, the characters, uh, the humans coming and acting as conquerors or discoverers in this sort of settler colonial tradition is much more central to Nolan's play. But we also have a number of thing, a number of sort of casual references and these sort of allusions and things like this that we get in McEwen's play that situate us within a, a realm of, of pop culture. So uh, Epops, for instance, who's, a, who's the half man, half bird, he, he was a human but became a bird to escape his deaths. Um, he's talking to X and, and Y about all of the, the food that's available to birds. Uh, and he says, the gardens are full of egg, eggplants and exquisite berries, not to mention poppies, mint, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Then stage directions. He pauses and remembers the song Marlboro Fair, which he sings. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, remember me to one who lives there. She once was a true love of mine. I didn't sing it, but you you get the point. So we have these sort of allusions, and we get this as well when the poet comes in, because uh, once they've decided to establish Cloudsville, they get a series of, of people, a poet, a seer, and a city planner. And the poet gives us, so some of it is bad beatnik poetry, like the kind of stereotypical beatnik poetry of like I'm going to repeat the same word multiple times and that's my my poem. So like one of his poems is black, 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 night, 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 night. And McEwen was in uh, she was in Toronto and she was in Montreal in I think the 50s and the 60s 
during the height of sort of the beatnik movement in Canada, and so she she was familiar with both the best and and the worst of beatnik poetry. So we get this sort of thing, but we also get the poet borrowing lines from from other poets. Um, like at one point he says, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Um, and so that's a reference to uh, God, to a Yeats poem. I'm sorry, uh, my mind went blank for just a second. Uh, and then later, as he's, as he's leaving off stage, he says, I saw the best minds of my generation, which is uh, a reference to Allen Ginsberg. So we get, and, and these are just a couple of the examples, but we get these allusions or we get these references throughout the play um, that are really, really uh, topical and, and sort of situate us within a, a pop cultural sphere. But the ending of McEwen's version is really interesting because in Aristophanes, uh, the the birds are successful they build their city they starve the gods into submission the humans agree to worship the birds as as deities and so the birds win they the the, the human who comes up with the idea of building uh, this cloud city what McEwen calls cloudsville uh, nolan calls it uh, cloud cuckoo land uh, I think the the version I think the translator that I used for my video on the Aristophanes version calls it Cuckoo Nebulopolis. Uh, I'm going to call it Cloudsville for the moment because that's the easiest of the of the three. Um, but the human who comes and and comes up with the idea of creating Cloudsville uh, marries uh, royalty, who's a, a deity and uh, basically becomes the new Zeus. In Yvette Nolan's version, uh, Eagle comes and reminds uh, the birds that they have rejected the uh, ownership ethos of humanity, and so the birds themselves tear down their city. McEwen gives us a third possible storyline where things just sort of collapse. Things just sort of don't work out under the political pressures of territorial ownership, immigration status, traffic laws, things like this, all of which X, uh, who's, who's here for much of the construction process, X is, is continually distressed to learn that these problems exist not just in metropolis but amongst the birds as well um, so at one point x says slowly and sadly are you suggesting that even utopia is not utopia and then the leader a couple of lines later uh, says the same thing that even utopia is not utopia which is of course linguistically really interesting point because utopia as, as many people know, uh, has two meanings from the ancient Greek, or from, from the, the, etym the Greek etym etymology. Um, one can mean the good place, the other can mean no place. So if we take even utopia is not utopia, linguistically this actually works quite well because it, mean, it can be read to mean uh, even the good place is no place, which is, of course, uh, one of the lessons that this play ultimately kind of teaches us. Um, so we get that. Um, but then later on we have a, a more sort of definite sense that this experiment of building a utopia has failed. Um, so X asks, what do we do with all the people from the metropolis, all the eager tourists, all the humans who long to be birds, eh? And then finally, the purple-tailed terror, who's a sort of philosopher, bird, says, easy, bring them down to earth, disillusion them, as man and bird and beast has been disillusioned since time began. 
clip their wings, ground them. Uh, and Prometheus, who's here just very briefly, leaves. And X says, you know what you just said, don't you? You said, in effect, to undo everything we've begun, to return to normal, whatever that is, to be, in fact, our usual bungling imperfect selves. The purple-tailed terror terror says, sad, isn't it? But that is what I meant. Maybe it's just too soon for any of us to try to surpass our shortcomings. Birds, men, whoever. And Y says, so there are no idyllic kingdoms. There are no utopias. There are no perfect places. Well, can't there just, uh, well, can't there even be something that's just plain nice? Okay, maybe we set our goals too high. Maybe we dreamed impossible dreams. Maybe we built castles in the air. But is it too much to ask of life that it become just a little bit better, for God's sake? Just a little bit nice? Is that asking too much, God's, is it? So we have this. Um, But then there's one more section that I think is really significant in the end of this play. Um, Poseidon and Heracles have come on behalf of the gods uh, who are starving without the the smoke of sacrifices coming up from uh, humanity. Um, And so we, we get this sort of final philosophical summing up. The leader of the bird says, so, the gods are placated, the humans have had their fun, and everything returns to what we must call normal. Y says, not really. And then to the purple tail Taylor, he says, terror, sorry, I don't know why I want to keep wanting to say Taylor. Uh, he says, what would you say, my philosophical friend? Is there such a thing as a best of all possible worlds? purple tail ter- terror says, There is, in my understanding, a present world, a world we live in here and now. It offers all the questions and provides some of the answers. The cuckoo clock, timidly stepping forward, says, Isn't it maybe a question of occupying the present, sort of moment by moment, tick by tick? Weather vane, who's another of the birds, says, or something like, well, as simple as just knowing where you stand and which direction you're pointing toward. X who's caught up in the dancing, says, Who cares? Who cares? In a very strange way, we've flown around in circles and finally come back home. And Y, who's also dancing, says, Maybe you're right, friend. Isn't the world just like a kaleidoscope, a bunch of colors and miracles going round and round? So, we've got this... I I think it's a very challenging ending to figure out exactly what's going on here because in a way it's a sort of resignation to the current, to the status quo, Uh, the failure of utopian dreams in a way, Uh, the failure to achieve the revolution and to build utopia, Um, but at the same time there's a reconciliation with that failure because the failure itself the failure itself may simply be a way of resituating ourselves in the world reorienting ourselves in the world and maybe it's from there maybe it's from that reorientation that we start moving toward the world that we want, not by escaping and building something new necessarily, but by reimagining or reorienting the place we are.